The Who has been one of the world's top rock bands for well over a decade. We've been talking to the group's John Entwistle, who told us how he became interested in music. When I was a, a kid, I was always interested in, uh, in music. I used to sing sort of old Jolson songs to my relatives and stuff like that. And when, uh, when I was about seven, I was forced to learn the piano by my mother, which I hated, you know, sort of normal sort of hunchback music teacher that wrapped the knuckles and everything. Um, and when I was about 10 or 11, I decided I wanted to learn the trumpet. So I managed to convince my mother that uh, I could still learn how to play the trumpet and teach myself the piano from then on, yeah. And she bought it, so I started learning the trumpet. And there were too many trumpets in the school orchestra, so I ended up playing French horn. And I made my own bass guitar when I was 14, so I wanted to be louder. Yeah, I wanted to play rock and roll like the rest of the kids instead of jazz. You know, I didn't particularly like jazz, and that was the only thing you could play trumpet on in those days. We asked John to name some of the rock and rollers he listened to in his formative years. Went to see the Bill Haley film when it came out, Rock Around the Clock. Yeah, and. Uh, I was listening to people like The Shadows, Eddie Cochran, Gene Vincent, Johnny Kidd, that sort of thing. And uh, Lonnie Donegan? Lonnie Donegan, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I don't know, it seemed to be a different era. I, I, I was playing the trumpet when other kids were playing skiffle. You know, I was playing sort of, uh, I was playing mainstream jazz, I suppose, you know, like I was into Kenny Ball and Acker Bilk and the rest of the kids at school were into sort of Lonnie Donegan and playing guitar and I caught on to the guitar only when it really sort of turned electric I suppose. The music of The Who, their bass player John Entwistle tells us the famous group was formed as a school band. It consisted of a sort of shadows type lineup, uh, guitar, rhythm guitar bass and drums and Pete Townsend was the rhythm guitarist and Roger also had his own group, he was the lead guitarist and he uh, one day invited me to sit in with his band because he needed a bass player and as his band was working on sort of uh, firm outings and stuff like that, you know, going down to Bognor or Brighton in the coach with the equipment in the back getting off halfway back at the pub and playing, you know, that sort of, that sort of gig. Um, I left the group I had at school when I was about 15 and joined his. And then uh, we brought in Pete on rhythm guitar later. And later on we got rid of the rhythm guitarist. And then it came, as a, I suppose, a change in, in our lineup when we, uh, we started realising that the Beatles were the, the new thing and like sort of vocal harmony and all this sort of business. We got rid of our lead singer and uh, Roger changed to singing. Pete changed to lead guitar and gradually Roger dropped the guitar and uh, just turned into a singer. We were influenced a lot by Johnny Kidd and the Pirates as well. In playing with Pete Townsend, I mean, he played a banjo for a while in the uh, jazz band I was in and uh, I must have been about 13 or 14 then so that's near enough, I suppose nearly 20 years with Roger it's been 18 years and with Keith 14, 15 years something like that. Few top bands have managed to stay together that long. We asked John for the secret of this longevity, pointing out that the members of The Who appear to have little in common. Yeah, we're four, four completely different people with sort of opposite st star signs. We're earth, air, fire and water. You know, and uh, People have d tried to do sort of astrological charts to uh, try and find out what makes us tick and, and all they come across is, is that uh, we were suited to each other, you know, it's sort of a, a perfect combination of people to form a group for some reason. Um, I don't know, maybe it was 
uh, the determination through all the fights to stick together. We weren't going to let disagreements amongst ourselves stop the group because we all believed in the group and that there was something magic that we had to hold on to and the group was very important to us. Um, we always enjoyed playing together, we enjoyed each other's company to a certain extent, not too much of it, you know. but we still enjoyed playing together and we still enjoy each other's company and we learn, I suppose it's like a marriage, you learn to live with each other, you, know, you learn the other people's faults and, and to accept them. The Who will soon be in the studio to record a new album. John Entwistle says that this will be one of the rare occasions when group members get together at the outset to exchange ideas for songs. Usually, uh, when we're writing songs, you know, people do uh, finish demos of the song and play them to us, and then we change them around to whatever we want them to be. You know, we change the bass part, the drum part, the, the arrangement, some of the words. Um, likewise, if I write any songs, I do a finished demo and present it to the group and just play it to them, you know. And really it's at the demo stage that the composer's done himself that we decide whether whether or not to do the number or to attempt the number, you know. Sometimes we will play play the number through in the, in the studio, you know, sort of rehearsing the actual backing track stage of it and decide that we're going to scrap the number at the backing track stage. You know, other times we'll do a few overdubs and then decide to scrap it. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff has been stopped at those, at those stages. But um, we don't really get together and talk about the songs themselves. We wait until we get in the studio. In fact, we usually wait until we get in the studio to learn the songs. But we're trying it a different way for this album. We're having about a two-week rehearsal at Shepperton, and then we're taking a month afterwards to rewrite the stuff or write new songs, you know, out of out of riffs that we've got from jamming. At this stage, John can't tell us much about what to expect on the new album. I don't really know. I haven't actually heard Pete's demos yet. Um, it won't it won't be anything uh, I don't think it'll be anything magnificently orchestral like Quadrophenia or Tommy. You know, I think it'll be uh, similar to the other album, but the, the words the words will have uh, less sort of deep meaning, I should think. And now more from John Entwistle of The Who. He's engaged in several projects that don't involve the group as a whole. Well, the one thing that I've just finished was playing on uh, Roger's solo album. I've played on about four tracks on the English version and about five tracks for the, for the American version. The American version is slightly different. The single's been taken off. Um, I did a little bit of backing vocals on Pete's album. Um, I was actually doing a cartoon history of The Who, but I've stopped that halfway through because I want to write some songs for the next album, so I've been writing songs. Uh, next week I go into the studio to produce a group called The Fabulous Poodles. Um, and the next project after that really is the Who rehearsals you know, and then the Who album. John Entwistle's last solo album was released about two years ago. He says that at the moment he doesn't have enough material together for another LP. I really wanted to think out my writing before I, I actually, you know, I, I could have sat down and written a load of stuff for an album and, and released it and nothing would have happened to it. But I really had to sit down and think out how I was going to do the album and who I was going to use on it. Um, It's very difficult, you know, releasing a solo album when you're still in the Who is really a, a difficult way of, of doing it because if anybody wants to hear you play, they can still go out and buy a Who album and they get Townsend, Daltrey, Entwistle and Moon all on the same album. So, um, it's very difficult. We've got a, a limited market unless you really sort of sit down and think, now, if I play with such and such a person and, and such and such another person and use them throughout the album, then it, there's going to be new interest. You know, you're going to get people from, from their side and people from your side buying the album. I know you deceive me, now here's a surprise.
John Entwistle says that after all these years as performers, members of The Who don't normally get very keyed up before concerts, but there are exceptions. We only usually get keyed up now before the first gig of a tour, you know, or if we haven't been playing for a long time. And we get, I, I usually get keyed up before, before a London gig, because uh, you can always guarantee that there's at least 30 people that you know personally in the audience somewhere. You know. And uh, I find it very hard to, to behave like a pop star on stage when, when my sort of uh, relations are watching me. You know. <laughs> I think, well, they really know me, you know, they've sort of they've known me all my life. How can I sort of get up there and do the whole sort of ego thing? You know. Other members of the Who are often in the news for non-musical activities. Pete promotes the cause of Mayor Barber, Roger is a film star, and Keith Moon is a hellraiser. John keeps a lower profile. I've got hobbies, but they're not really, uh, they're not really sort of publicity sort of stuff. Yeah, you know. I I go fishing, I skeet shoot, I draw. You know. I, I suppose the art side of things is. It's starting to come out now. You know, I'm about halfway through the cartoon history, and uh, seems to be working out very well. And I'm hoping to publish that sometime next year. I've got my own publishing company ready for it, called Ox Tales Limited. John Entwistle, who went on to talk about some of the music he's been listening to lately. I listen to a lot of uh, Eagles, Joe Walsh, uh, Doobie Brothers. Um, occasionally to uh, stuff like uh, Graham Central Station, things like that. I, I don't. I usually like music as a as a background. You know. Most of the time, if I'm having a party, it'll be some really sort of old rock and roll stuff. You know, I've got a jukebox full of it, and I just let people stick the stuff on. Magic bar. Our current guest is John Entwistle of The Who, who recalls a memorable event. Looking back on it now, now it's all over, I think Woodstock was, was pretty exciting, but uh, it wasn't particularly exciting for us at the time because we were, we were due to go on stage at six in the evening and uh, we found out that no one was getting paid. So we said, all right, we're not going to leave the hotel until the money arrives. You know? So. The money arrived and we finally left the hotel at four. But by then the helicopters that were transferring the people to backstage were being used to fly in medical supplies for the ODs that were going on there. And uh, we had to drive in. And when we finally got there and we got changed to go on stage and there was mud all over the place, there was acid in the fruit juice and STP in the coffee and the toilets were piled about 10 feet high in toilet paper and, and other refuse. <laughs> and uh, I, had a, I had a bottle of bourbon with me, which I was drinking to quench my thirst, because I, I trusted that because I brought it from the hotel. And I got pretty sloshed, and then I really got thirsty, so I had some fruit juice. So then we all ended up out of our brains completely, because, you know, the band sort of, every band went on and overran, you know, they sort of didn't want to get off stage because they were getting turned on by sort of 600,000 people, you know. And we finally went on at six o'clock the next morning. But the main thing was that we, we got on stage, and it was still dark, and uh, we played Tommy more or less in its entirety. And when we got to the song I'm Free, where he gets back his sight and everything, suddenly the dawn came up and it was daylight and it really freaked the whole audience out. Why don't you all when The Who started out, they were regarded as symbols of youthful rebellion. We asked John Entwistle if they were angry and out to change society. No, not really. I, I don't know whether Pete felt that way, but I, I never did. I mean, I was, a, I was an old rocker that had been converted into a mod. You know, I always thought we were too old to be mods, but the, the mod kids seemed to identify with us. And uh, we had some sort of, our first few songs were very angry songs. Uh, we were very violent on stage. And uh, off stage, we ended up just as violent, I suppose, you know. 
We had a lot of fights between ourselves and we always seemed to be getting into trouble and thrown out of hotels. Um, I think that about the strongest feeling I ever had was when we first went over to the States and uh, we used to get the mickey taken out of us for wearing such strange clothes and having long hair. You know, in those days, you, you're supposed to see everybody's ears, you know, and sideboards were not supposed to be over a half inch long. <laughs> now it's completely changed over there. But uh, in the early days when we were over there, we were looked on as, as freaks, and that made me very angry. Yeah. So it appears that the Who weren't angry in quite the same way as some of today's punk rockers are, or claim to be. I suppose after, after the war, uh, we were, I suppose we were used to sort of hardships and, you know, the good old blitz and England will come through and all that sort of business. And, I mean, there was, a, there was a different kind of violence in those days. We weren't angry at anything in particular, just angry at boredom, really, you know. Maybe it's different nowadays, I don't really know what they're angry about, but uh, <laughs> I'm still angry about income tax and government. <laughs> Recently, both Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey of The Who have spoken in support of Britain's new wave rock movement. John Entwistle says that he hasn't heard much of this sort of music. I don't go out of my way to sort of listen to new stuff at all. You know. I, I, I find it, it's, it tends to sort of interfere with my writing. I listen to a lot of new stuff. I just about got out of it, but I started getting influenced by the Eagle stuff because I was playing it so much, and uh, yeah, all my stuff ended up sort of really strummy acoustic stuff, and, and you know, I really had to snap out of that. So I, I uh, started writing writing on piano again, which changes my style completely. The radio is on all day in the kitchen. But, you know, when I, whenever I'm in the kitchen, I listen to the radio, but uh, they don't seem to be playing much of the new wave stuff at all. You know. Someone should be playing it, radio-wise, but no one seems to be, yet. We asked John if he still expected to be involved in rock and roll when he was 60. I don't really think I'm going to reach 60 anyway. <laughs> no, I mean, the, 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 the way I live my life, sort of drinking and smoking and uh, having a good time, I don't really think I'm going to live that long unless by some chance the sort of brandy is pickling my body and sort of preserving it. Yeah. Um, I, 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 can, I can see the who carrying on for as long as we're doing stuff that we like and that we believe in. You know, if, if, we're, uh, if we're recording new albums, if we like the stuff we're writing and we really believe that it's, it's good, compared to the rest of the stuff about, then uh, we'll carry on, you know. But as soon as something starts to drop, I think we'll probably decide that, OK, we do a farewell tour, which will probably, you know, if we play to everybody who wanted to see us, it would probably take us two years to do the farewell tour, but then we'd stop after that. John Entwistle now, who tells us about an important factor governing the amount of touring done by The Who. It's very difficult to... Uh, for who to go on stage and play the same old stage act over and over again. You know, we, we get disinterested in it. And uh, we usually try and drop a stage out before we get disinterested in it. Uh, Tommy just went up way over the top. You know, we had to play it continually for three years. And we, we don't particularly want that to happen again because that, that took us off the road for a couple of years when we stopped doing Tommy. Well, it will soon have the... Uh material from the new album to draw on. Will you be touring probably pretty soon after the release of that? Yeah, we're, we're, when we came off our last American tour last November, um, it was a really good tour and we were sort of really up and we, I think we all could have carried on playing and touring for the next six months, you know, just on the strength of that one tour and how we enjoyed ourselves. But, uh, the fact still remained that we needed some new stuff to inject into the stage act. And uh, we're still hoping this, al this album will supply it. This is why we're re actually rehearsing before we go in to do the album so that we can make sure that there are some songs suitable for stage on the next album. Because as far as the last album was concerned, there was only two that uh, were really suitable. And two albums doesn't two tracks don't sort of 
change the stage act particularly that much. Finally, we asked John when we could expect release of The Who's next album. Well, it'd be really nice if we had it out by Christmas, but uh, that would be the earliest as far as I know. Um, we've got August off, well, I think we're going into the studio in September, so it just, just leaves sort of October, November. December, so we might just about get it out for Christmas. Our guest was John Entwistle of The Who. Until our next report, goodbye. Yeah,